it's monday once again and i'm glad to be back a live show on the tracker has been rare in this covid 19 times but hopefully we are gradually moving into normalcy and so today on the tracker we'll be bringing you an exciting guest well if i think about it i can't think of one who has made the transition from playing into life after football perhaps better than the man on the show today he will be here to tell you about what has made his story as rich as it is but as always we'll get into our motivational video it has to do with patience and persistence and then when we come back i'll get into the introduction of our guest and then we'll begin today's show <laughs> only two things can get you through this man that's patience and persistence we all aspire we all have the same emotions you know, no matter who you are, where you're from, we all have the same emotions. You know, we all want to be successful. You know, we all have the same fears of failure. We all have, you know, uh, you know, this uh, feelings of abandonment. We all, you know, want love. You have uh, such a strong belief in yourself that you can quiet out all the outside noise because that's, you're gonna need that on every step of the way. There are people that, that are projecting their fears and their um, shortcomings and failures on you. And you have to be very careful, you know, with that. People telling you can't do that. Why, Why can't, can't I? Because they may have tried or they don't believe that they can do it. And it's not really about you. It's about what they feel and their uh, fear inside. So you have to be strong enough and resilient to believe in whatever it is you're trying to do. My uncle, he was telling me like, I'm never gonna, my uncle said I never sold a million records. I sold a million records like a million times. Are you crazy? How are you gonna do that? How? You know, I'm sure there's things that I do now that he, he can't believe that I was able to accomplish. But he couldn't even see it at the time. So he was just projecting from his fears on me. Lock my body, can't trap my mind. Easily explain why we adapt to crime. I'd rather die enormous than live dormant. That's how we own it. And you gotta understand the reason, right? Why does that guy think like that? Right? How do, how do you arrive at that point? You gotta also look at that. You have to look at that. You got to look at the environments and places we live in and how things are set up and how things are structured and how we're always the last on the totem pole, even from our school and to our roads to, you know, everything that, we, that all the obstacles that's placed in front of us. Even our living conditions. You live in a project. Someone lives here, 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 and here. You know, you have to deal with all these different type of personalities. You have, you're in the box. Someone's above you, below you, to the right of you, and to the left of you. And every day you have to manage that circle. So, living, that's like living dormant. Life is about balance, right? You have to have some type of balance. You have, like, time for work and it's time for play. And if you don't allow these two things to coexist, you have an imbalance people look at you strange saying you changed like you worked that hard to stay the same like you're doing all this for a reason and what happens most of the time people change people change around you because they start treating you different because of your success so you are changing you don't change who you are the core of who you are the things you believe the things you love and the things you die for and your principles you don't change that but you're going to change who you are you're going to change you know you can't do the same things that you, you can't hang on the corner to yourself you know it sounds like a, a very simple thing to do but it's not it's not simple to do with all the pressures to succeed and all the pressures to once you succeed to stay there you have a belief in yourself and, and some and sometimes in most cases it's almost a naivete about who you are and what you can contribute to um, to the game belief in oneself and knowing who you are, I mean, that's the foundation of everything great. Patience and persistence. And there's none other to usher us through that world of patience and persistence than the man on my left. Yusuf Chipsa, it's good to have you on the tracker. 
Thank you very much. Typically, I would shake hands, but it's COVID time, so I'd give you the fist in the air. This way. I think this is enough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, what have you been up to? What have you been up to? The life of an intermediary um, football has been cut off for what two months, a little over two months. Before we even get into your background, what's life been during this COVID times? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been unusual. Uh, it's not been normal at all. Um, we all know uh, the effect of uh, COVID-19. Mm. Uh, I mean, it has, it's more or less like a World War Three. True. Uh, it has affected the global economy yeah. uh, immensely. But we, we are adjusting. We hope uh, things will get better, too, better soon. But then, whether we like it or not, COVID has come to stay. Yeah. Uh, so we just have to take very good care of ourselves yeah. and follow the directives and precautions given yeah. so that we will stay away from from COVID-19 and together we can fight this. Mm. I'll get into the technicalities of that as we get along with the interview but l let's start from your, your beginnings as a man because I'm sure that a lot of people look at you now and it's hard for them to reconcile the man who uh, has so many parts to him. E economist at a point uh, you were in school learning when you were playing, but what is the foundation of all that? Where was Yusuf Chipsa born? Where were you brought up? Uh, yes, I was born uh, in Kumasi, Old Tafu, okay. to be precise. Yes, um, my father was working with the uh, State Transport Corporation mm. at that time. Mm. So at the age of five, uh, he was transferred to Accra. Okay. So we moved to Accra. So I actually grew up in Accra, Teshin, oh. to be precise, yes. I had my elementary school at the Help Your Child Revitary School, okay. and then uh, Teshin and Y State GSS. Mm. Then I moved to Kumasi back uh, to have my secondary education at Pembe College, mm. and then Kumasi Polytechnic before mm. I left Ghana. Talk to me a little bit about your young days as an early footballer, your, your early contact with the sport. Now, I realize that your family moves, you come in and then you move back again. Mm. How did you establish contact with football first and foremost? Well, as, um, as every Ghanaian footballer, uh, it all starts with uh, street football mm. and then backyard football, uh, small parks behind the house and, and stuff like that. So uh, it started like that and then through the 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 primary school yeah. i think that was where um people realized that yeah. uh, i've got the talent so right from there i was the the, the football uh, team captain um, this is primary school yes in this primary was school. your daily stars cold days exactly even before i joined daily stars okay. uh, at primary school uh, i was the football uh, team captain and then uh, at p6 i became the the sports prefect wow and then uh, started playing for Daily Stars, U12, U14. Hmm. So, so that is how it all started. So leadership has always been a part of your story. You, you seem to cling hard to Premper College as an institution. I've seen um, instances where you've done donations to the school, you've visited the school, tried to reconnect with the school. How special is that place to you in terms of your journey in what you have become as a footballer and also as an intermediary? Uh, I think uh, it's been uh, a culture of the school. Um, any, any old student of the school, anybody who goes through the school yeah. will tell you. Um, whilst you are in school, you see ex, um, uh, ex students or, yeah. or, or past students of yeah. the school visiting and, and doing donations, yeah. helping. So as you go through the system, you also develop that culture and habit. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so after school, when you have you have you have the yeah. privilege or you have the opportunity, yeah. you also want to do same. So, uh, I think it has been a part of the training we get from from mm. the school. Mm. Now, I'll start from where everybody first got to really know you, which was Asante Kotoko or maybe Kim Faisal Babies. Tell us a little bit about wanting to pair education with professional football. Because not a lot of people have tried to go along that path. What was your mindset like? Did you think you could actually succeed playing football and going to school at the same time? Uh, it was tough, but I actually um, had the click it could work when 
when I came to Prempe College, and then uh, my my mate Edmond Oswansa oh. introduced me to to Connors Babies. He was playing for Connors Babies then, mm. so that that's where it all started. Uh, before that, it was normal playing street football, U twelve, U fourteen football, and then going to school at the same time. Yeah. But I realized um, I could do this when I when I go to Prempe College, and then also playing for for Connors Babies because. Connors Babies was, they were training at um, Asim Park. Okay. And Pepe College was at, uh, um, um, what was the place? Uh, the area, I forgot. I Santasi, mean, it's it, 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 it? not, not fantastic. It wasn't so full line. Yeah. Pepe College was so full line. Yeah. So um, you need to travel a distance to go to training okay. and then come back to school. So you need to manage those things. So I think that is where it all started. I, I got a feeling from there that. This is tough, but then this is doable. And and for my digging up, I I I found out that in your times when you were at the Polytechnic, after you were done with Pempe College, mm. um, you basically had to study concurrently with your football playing calendar. How how, how challenging was this? It was very challenging. It was very tough uh, at that stage. Uh, moreover, when when I got invited to the national team to mm. the to the U twenty. Because we had to camp in Winneba from Monday to Friday, yeah. uh, we will be released to join our various clubs yeah. for the weekend uh, Premier League games. Sure. So um, it was very tough at that time. I think I was in my second year, going to my third year. So um, what I usually do is, when I when I come from Winneba, mm -hmm. uh, I go straight to school, okay. get the handouts, <coughs> get the handouts and papers for my mates, do photocopies. And then I go to camp with Kim Faisal. If it's an away game, we wow. usually travel on, on Fridays or Saturdays. So if it's an away game, I, I go with my photocopies, uh, my <laughs> handouts, and then whilst in the car, I'll be reading. Whilst at the hotel, I'll be reading. When I get back to Winneba, I'll be reading as such. So uh, it, it was tough. It got to a point that um, some of my mates used to tease me, like Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis would tell oh, yeah. me, Joe Lewis would tell me, Masa, I have a boy, how? <laughs> Uh, because he wants to put off the light. So oh, you're kidding me. Exactly. We were, we were I think, um, in Winneba, we had yeah. these two beds. So mm. sometimes three in the room. So it was me, him, uh, Banayani sometimes in the room. Also Banayani, Banayani, the goalkeeper. Mm. Yeah. So no, they used to tease me uh, during those times. And it was tough, especially when I was in my third year. Yeah. I was preparing for, for, for graduation, so it was really tough at that time. But uh, with perseverance and hard work, I went through. Hmm. Now, moving from Kim Faisal Babies to Asante Kotoko, remember this was 2003, around 2003. Yeah. Asante Kotoko was so star studded that when I looked at the, the, the team sheet again, I'm like, wait, Chips have played in this same era? Yeah. Everybody I can think about from Kotoko was there. Shalal Hassan. Uh, Emba Power was yeah. in there, Isaac Boache was in and, there, yeah. Hamza Mohammed was yeah. in there, especially that midfield, William Tero, Hamza. I mean, how do you come from Kim Faisal believing that you can actually break into a team like this and become a mainstay? Uh, it, was, it was a tough decision, as you said, because at that time, um, Abloadi was there, he was the captain of the team, yeah. uh, Hamza was there. I think William Tero came uh, after me. Um, Edmondo Sansan came after me. Uh, oh, we came the same year with Edmondo yeah. Sansan, but Steve Nodro mm -hmm. was also there. Yeah. Asante, we Aziz came to, was there. We came together. Aziz Ansa was there. Yeah. But then, uh, I mean, I, I had already been with Kim Faisal for three years yeah. uh, in Kumasi. Okay. We've met Kotoko. Uh, had, had Kotoko three. been trying to put you all that time? No, it's actually that, that very year. Mm. Uh, but f first and second year was okay. I think the end of the second year, they tried, but then um, they couldn't really, they didn't really go ahead with it. Mm. But the third year, it was actually um, Mr. Herbert Mensah who initiated the, the move. And then along the line, he had to switch camp mm. from Kotoko to King Faisal. Yeah. So he actually didn't want me to, to move. But I was, I was bent on, yeah. on joining uh, Kotoko because it has always been my dream. Mm. And uh, I didn't want to lose on that opportunity. So even though there were, I, I saw tough um, competition over there with mm -hmm. Abloade, Hamza, mm -hmm. and the rest, I was still bent on joining Kotoko because it was the team that I, I loved and I really wanted to play for that team. 
talking about a team that you love now i saw that picture with charles taylor in there and michael osse in there before we get into this defeat from from such a star started crop who was your favorite teammate within this mix and why uh yes i think i, I hung up uh, a lot of times with charles taylor mm. uh, because we were all staying at Asida house the same hotel we stayed there for about a year uh, before we, we moved out so yeah. I was most of the time hanging out with, with, with him, but Edmundo Ansan, Edmundo Ansan was, was my close pal because... Edmundo Ansan was such an underrated midfielder yeah, back then. Yeah, because we schooled together yeah. at Prempe College, we schooled together at Kumasi Polytechnic, mm. we played together at Connors Baby, so I was, I was really bonding well with him. Mm. Um, yes. But like I said, I was hanging out more with Charles because we stayed at the same, at the same hotel. Hmm. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure I could, you, you'd be the perfect person to answer this. From my point of view, just personally, I think that Charles Taylor in Accra Hearts of Folk versus Charles Taylor at Kotoko was not the same. He didn't meet the same heights that was expected of him when he joined Kotoko. Knowing him personally, what, what would you think would have accounted for that? Uh, it's, it's really difficult to, to say, but then, uh, yes, uh, it was two different environments, uh, two mm. different crop of players. Uh, he... He had already been with us for for I think three years yeah. or, or so. So I mean the the bond was there, the yes. unity was there, and you you could all tell the the hula walu around his transfer from from us to Kotoko. So yeah. um, I mean I commend him. He, he's he's mentally tough. He's yeah. such a tough player because only few players could actually go handle through. that transition. Exactly. He did well. Uh, and I remember in his first game he scored. Yeah. It was in in Sunyane. And that was his first game for us. He scored, and uh, you could see that the guy really has something. But like, like you said, uh, there was a whole lot of issues here and there, yeah. uh, spiritual things. Yeah. And things. But then, I mean, you can't take that away from Chastela. He, he's a great player. Hmm. Um, that defeat to Accra Hearts of Folk in the Confed Cup final, especially happening in Kumasi, um, Walk, walk me through that. I mean, after you lost the game, what was the mood like in the dressing room? How did you yourself feel as a club? How, how did it change your trajectory or not as a footballer? Uh, well, personally, I was, I was off three days. Um, I, I didn't go out. Uh, wow. For three days, I was, I was indoor. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Wow. I mean, we, we had us of folk. I mean, we had control yeah. of them. We, we we had no excuses to have lost that cup. But uh, uh, casting my mind back, I think House of Folk, they were just destined to win that game. Because mm. if you look at the first leg in Accra, yeah. uh, we went ahead to score. They sure. equalized sure. In, in the injury excess, mm -hmm. extra time. Yeah. And in Kumasi, we went ahead to score. They equalized and then they won with penalties. So um, in, both, in both games, we, we were on top. Mm. But just that, like I said, for me, I think it's, it's destiny. As of folk were just lucky and they were destined to win, to win that trophy. I mean, that trophy cost us a lot. Looking at the promises that we had and, and, the, and our bonuses and stuff that we were supposed to get, if you think about that, I mean, uh, we just had no excuse mm. to, to, have, to have not uh, won well, that, 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 uh, that trophy. There's the, there's the popular school of thoughts that the decision by then manager Hans Data Schmidt to hook Taylor from the game might have been a factor. Do you, do you share in that school of thoughts too? Yes, after watching the game again on, on GTV Sports Plus a couple, recent, of, very couple recent, of weeks yeah. ago, I, I believe that uh, the changes was done at the wrong time, at the, especially in the second leg. Mm. At the time that we effected our, our changes, we were leading, we yeah. were on top of the game, we were yeah. controlling the game. So we needed no change at, at that particular yeah. time. Uh, but then, it, unfortunately, uh, he was in charge, he's the manager, mm. he's been the person who has taken us through yeah. the, the, the prelims, the qualifying stages up to the final. So uh, we trusted his judgment and we, we believed that it, it was the right thing that he was doing. But then, after some years and looking at the video again, you could tell that uh, we needed we we needed not to do those changes at that particular time hmm. interesting now i'd like to ask you also about life after that because like i said 
that team was supposed to be the special Asante Kotoko team. And you came in under Herbert Mensah. These days, Kotoko has changed. I came in under um, Nana Bantumahene. Nana Bantumahene. Yeah. And then Herbert Mensah took It was over. actually Herbert who initiated uh, the move to, to sign me on to Kotoko. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the line... Mm -hmm. He had to uh, move. Yes, he left mm -hmm. Kotoko mm -hmm. and took mm -hmm. over King Faisal. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm definitely sure that you witnessed his tenure as CEO of the club and even at King Faisal. You are a Kotoko guy through and through, and you know their activities. You work with them even till today. They've instituted a new board. Um, Before that, actually, yeah. um, I, I have to be honest. It yeah. was what Herbert Mesa did at Kotoko yeah. that attracted most of us, mm. aside as being uh, the fan of the club, yeah. aside as being... He made the club attractive. Exactly. And we used to we used to camp most of the time at the same place. Kim Faisal and Kotoko used to camp at the same place, St. Hubert's. So and we have friends there, okay. uh, Stephen Odrew, because we are all products of Connors yeah, Babies. Yeah. Stephen Odrew, Emba, and Co. They, I mean, we, we had friends there. And we, we saw how they were being treated, how, how whatever, everything. So um, that was also an inf influen influential mm -hmm. Uh, factor, factor that mm. led to our decision. Even mm. when he left, mm. when he left to King mm. Faisal, I, I, I was still bent on joining the club. Mm. Mm. Now, like you said, everybody points to the Herbert era as perhaps the golden era of management for the club. These days, the club has reverted more to handing the team to a rich entrepreneur who, on his decision, might decide to form a board or not to run the club. Kwame Chi ran a sort of a one-man show with an administration now he's been asked to constitute a board that he hates um, if you look at the structure of the club are you happy with what is going on with it currently and what do you think they can do to make what they are doing now better uh, if I get a question right um, are you talking about the current structure or, or the, the formation of the, of the new board well the formation of the new board basically they've been taxed to make money for the club, make the exactly. club financially viable and also successful on, 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 on the pitch. Yeah. Do, you, do you believe that they can move that mandate forward and perhaps break new grounds we haven't seen with administrations of the past? Yeah, I think if you look at the, the personalities uh, in the nine-member board, I mean, uh, with their um, CVs, uh, they have the, the capability to do whatever mandate assigned them. Uh, you know, um, knowledge doesn't reside with one person, mm. and, and there are nine of them. So I, I, I expect, or the, 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 the whole uh, Kotoko fraternity yeah. expects them to, to actually achieve the mandate given them. If you look at the, the, the mandate spelled out in the release, uh, yeah. they are supposed to formulate policies. Yeah and then uh, put in uh, uh, corporate governance okay. to make sure that uh, Kodoko is being managed at a professional level. Uh, Kwame Chi has been doing this all alone for, for the past three years, and, and Mencia feels or thinks that it's time for a board to be constituted, which I think is, is a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. A club like Kotoko should, should have proper structures. For me, uh, currently or before the formation of the board, uh, the structures were not so clear. You, you couldn't even identify uh, who does what and, and, and what kind of structure it was. It was a more or less like a caricature form of a, of a structure. So we expect this current uh, nine-member board to, to form a proper structure and then formulate policies and strategies to see Kotoko to the dreamland. Mm. Now, we know that as I'd say Kotoko, I know that when you and I sit here and discuss it, it sounds very straightforward. But mm. if you are in Kumasi and on the ground, you realize that the structure of the club includes more than just the people who have been appointed to a board or to a position. From my colleague, radio journalists, to fanatics of the, of, who are fans, do you believe that the structure that they have in its entirety will allow this board to succeed? Oh, yes. I mean, um, of course, the, the board, they, they should succeed because uh, if you, t you talk about the stakeholders, maybe, yeah. um, they've got their role to play. But the mandate here has been given to the board. And, you see, and when Kotoko belongs to Otunfo, yeah. and when he speaks, it's, it's, it's final. final. So, so far as this release is from, is from the palace, and <coughs> fans of Kotoko or the entire uh, Kumasiman yeah. 
hails with him for, mm -hmm. and the respect is too much to the extent that I don't think any fan or anybody outside will try to disrespect anything that uh, the king mm -hmm. has said. So um, all the board needs is the maximum support. Now the the mandate has been given to them. It's up to them to 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 form their management and then to put in place uh, mm -hmm. proper policies and, yeah. and, and strategies for the board uh, or for the management to, to execute. Mm. Next up, we'll talk about your time with the national team. And most people seem to not know that you have over 50 caps at various levels, right from the junior levels, right from the Olympic team, the mm. senior national team itself. It has all gone under the radar. I'll show you a video here right on the screen quickly. It was perhaps your only goal you scored while at the national team level. And then we'll come back inside and talk about this. Definitely, and of course, I'm sure they're also overawed by So plenty of action in these early stages of this game. You see Chipsa. So far, nothing to complain about for Harrison. You see Chipsa beginning to find his easy one for Denis Onyango. Team had a miserable tournament, eventually being dumped Joffrey. Closely guarded education by Jonathan Menton. Where he really made his mark and got his debut in March 2007 when he got to play against Brazil. A match Ghana lost by a goal to know. His fortunes have dipped since. Good play from Ghana. It's you see Chipsa. John Pinto with the free kick. Well defended by Uganda. Well almost Ghana still has the ball. It's Chipsa! Yes, yeah, so that free kick, the first touch, yeah. the finish, that, that was some lovely stuff. If you ever scored one goal for a national team, I'd take that. If that was me, if that was me I'd take that all day. But your national team has, like I said, a lot of holes in it. You, you, you featured heavily for the team during the 2006 World Cup qualifiers. Yeah. And then before the, the qualifiers, you were, before the World Cup itself, you were placed on the standby list. Did you, did you feel slighted by that? fact that you had contributed that you deserve to be there at the tournament uh well uh, yes somehow but um uh if you look at a country like ghana and qualifying for for the world cup actually i'm one of the few players that was involved from day one i mean from the first prelim uh, preliminary game uh, in accra and the last game in the Cape Verde. Uh, i've been with the team throughout there were I missed some few games that I didn't have a call-up, but then um, considering the number of players in Ghana and being part of a standby team, though I was a little bit disappointed for not making the the 23-man the squad, uh, but then I, I, I felt it was also a honor to be part of the team at, at the World Cup just to, to have the feeling and the experience. Having already been at the Olympic mm -hmm. uh, Games, uh, it would have been an, an icing of the cake if I had, have, mm. uh, if I had uh, made it to the final 23-man squad in, in Germany. But all the same, it was a nice experience and uh, I never regret. Mm. Now, I'm about to get into some, some semi-controversial stuff that perhaps didn't get as much attention back then. It was some unrest allegedly in that 2006 World Cup camp that didn't get as much attention as the 2014 Brazil World. We'll be getting into that in a bit, but we are still watching the tracker here on City TV. I'm talking to former Asante Kotoko and Ghana International, now 10 FIFA intermediary Yusuf Chipsa. It's about to get a tad more interesting. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You are still watching the tracker here on City TV. We are chatting with Yusuf Chipsa. Yusuf, let me take you back again to the 2006 World Cup. Now, mm. Baba Mando says that during that World Cup, um, of the energy from neighboring country Togo, who were agitating for a hike in their monies at the time, Ghana caught the bug and decided that our money should also be hiked up. Um, we know for a fact that tensions were rife in camp, tests were thrown around and whatnot. Um, what, what was the situation in camp like with regards to those bonuses and talk of bonuses before the Germany World Cup? Yeah, actually, um, there was a meeting with the, with the management uh, team mm -hmm. uh, to discuss bonuses. And at that particular point, we, 
we raised the issue of uh, appearance fee. Actually, it was myself and uh, Otuado okay. who, who raised uh, that issue because we've had information from, from uh, other, other colleagues from other countries, mm. uh, something of that sort. So I actually read uh, mm. in the news that yeah. there is some um, amount of money paid to... You were a student every, of the game through and every, through. Every situation. <laughs> so I, I went to Stephen and uh, told Stephen that, uh, Stephen, uh, there is some amount of money paid to, to us for qualifying to, to the World Cup, and we think that as it's been done to other countries, yeah. uh, we, sh we also deserve to yeah. to get some appearance fee. So we raised the issue up. Otuado also made some few calls from his colleagues in the German mm -hmm. team, which they also confirmed. So that was where we, we the, uh, the issue of appearance fee mm. started. So it was, we bargained for it, and then that is how come, as a result of that, the standby players were separated from, from, ah. from the main 23. Man squad. It, is, it was a chip sat thing. You, you started the paradigm shift. Well, uh, unfortunately, I was part of the standby team, so that division uh, came up after the issue of the of the. Did you get paid as part of the? Uh, of the no, squad? We, were, we were promised uh, ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. I think the, those in the twenty-three man squad had fifty thousand mm -hmm. as an appearance fee, and the standby players were promised ten thousand dollars. But we are yet to receive that money. You are kidding? <laughs> Seriously. In twenty twenty. Yeah, Money yeah, you yeah. were promised in 2006 yeah, yeah, yeah. has it not passed your pocket. It was five of us. I mean, you could check from any of them. It was myself, uh, Bafo Jan, mm -hmm. um, Baba, Baba Mando, yeah. Aziz Ansan, Filmo Makati. Oh wow! Five of us. Yeah. H have you have you made any attempts to recover this money? Oh, a um, couple of years after that. Uh, I mean, some of the players uh, inquired, so we got in touch with the FA, then FA president, uh, Mr. Kusinyantechi, and he, he actually accepted that, oh yeah, he remembers about that money, but the FA was in financial difficulty, so when they get money, they will pay us. So th that was all. We've not followed it again, but we've also not received that money. You make the negotiations sound very diplomatic like you sat at the table with them but from brazil 2014 i can glean that that's not how the negotiations really went down what was it was it hostile what, what happened for something to give for every all the parties to come to the oh, table it, it was peaceful actually um there was the, no chair through. the management uh, they didn't expect us to to throw that, <laughs> to throw that to them about to raise an issue about the appearance fee. So it was a bit um, tense. Uh, yeah, yeah, a bit shock to them. So who, who was leading the negotiation from the management side? It was uh, Fred Papo, Randy Abbe. Yes, I think they they were the two main mm. guys who were there. But later there was another meeting that was held uh, concerning the same money and. Uh, mm. uh, the FA president himself was there, uh, but then that was when the tensions began to 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 rise. I mean, but uh, I don't know the day it was it was peaceful because some of the players made made uh, very clever points there that uh, we are together. It's 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 a whole team. We've been we've been in Scotland. We've been in in London mm. before we came to Germany. Yeah. So as a team. Yeah. So there shouldn't be any discrimination when it comes to the issue of money. Yeah. Uh, and, and that is why uh, players like Sule Montari and uh, Stephen Apia and the rest they were fighting that at least um, there shouldn't be any mm. discrimination yeah. uh, when it comes to the appearance fee. They they were proposing that. Uh, each and every one, whether you are a standby member or yeah. you are a member of the 23, should get the 50,000. But uh, finally, it was agreed that uh, the standby players get 10,000 and then the, the, those in the 23 man squad get, get the 50,000. Mm. From there, um, we were separated from, from the 23 man squad. I think it was in Cologne when we traveled to Cologne for the game against Czech Republic, yeah. I remember. So it was the same apartment, but uh, the 23 they put you squad, in a different yeah, side of the apartment. Were, they were, let's say, on the on the left side, and you, we were. We I'm, were I'm the, sure you were not side. very happy. Oh no, we were cool actually because whether you like it or not, you're a standby player. But uh, mm. 
Um, some players were not happy. Baba Mandu was not happy, yeah. actually. Uh, Bafo Jan, because Bafo Jan was one of the players that really uh, contributed a lot in, in the qualifiers. It, at a point in time in Kumasi, one of the games, I remember uh, he was injured. But we've yeah. already exhausted our our, our changes, yeah. so he couldn't go out. So he injured. His hand was, Bandi was bandaged yes, yeah. around uh, the the shoulder. Yeah. Had he to had to finish it. the game to that. So when he cast his mind back to all those stuffs, and today he's a standby member, and because of that, some members who never appeared in any of the qualifying games. They, they were never in camp even for once, hmm. but uh, fortunately for them, they were in the 23-man squad. Right. For them to get 50,000 and for him who actually participated... Sweater to get... To exactly, there. to yeah. get 10,000. That was, that was the, the argument, so, hmm. um, which made sense because yeah. made a lot they, of sense. the players got the, the, the appearance fee yeah. because we qualified. And those who were involved in the qualifying uh, games yeah who unfortunately found themselves to be standby players yeah. uh, are supposed to get 10,000 and that. But uh, I mean, at the end of the day, um, it, looks, it to looks to me from, from where I said that Brazil was really a ticking time bomb. It was coming. Brazil 2014 was coming based on these agitations. Well, I, I wasn't in Brazil. I wasn't part of the team. I wasn't there. So but I were actually, you surprised when you heard I actually it? didn't know the genesis of it. But from what we heard or from what we read, um, I think the the appearance fee delayed, yeah. and uh, kept that, delaying. That that caused the the agitations and the the impatience from the players. But you see, when you are dealing with players, mm -hmm. uh, you should know how to handle them. I think the the management team in two thousand and six uh, were able to handle us very well, mm. though some of some of the standby players were not happy. There wasn't any any chaotic situation over everything there. was handled internally exactly everything everything was cool over there so um i like i said i wasn't i wasn't in Brazil I wasn't there, so I can't talk much mm. about but, but, but we can only mm. base our comments on what we heard and what we read. You still won't tell us who threw the chair in Brazil no in two thousand and six i i actually i don't remember. <laughs> 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 Interesting. <laughs> Let's talk about your time with the Olympic team because um, you are basically the last team to have represented Ghana at the Olympics. It's been so I long. I wish this jinx would be, would be broken yeah. very soon. I actually feel un uncomfortable when it's always said that. Yeah, uh, you're the last team to have exactly. been there. Exactly. And I was actually looking forward to this uh, present past team to have actually made it to Tokyo uh, 2020. But unfortunately, um, they, they couldn't. How, how tricky is the journey? How, I mean, if I think about it, I find it hard to wrap my head around that we haven't been to the Olympics since 2004. How, uh, how difficult is it? I mean, the, the structure of the competition or the structure of the, of the qualifying uh, stages have mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. During our time, um, uh, we need to go through a qualifying stage for, for all African games. Yeah. And then after that, another qualifying stage for for Olympic Games. But now it's it's more or less like a like a, a nation's uh, cup, cup uh, yeah. like a tournament that you need to go in order to to qualify to the stage. I, so I don't know which of them is is easier. But then uh, I think both of them is not easy to qualify. You you need to to really prepare very well. I I believe in preparation. Uh, in order to be successful, you need to prepare, mm. and the preparation covers all areas. Uh, I mean, um, physically, um, sporting-wise, yeah. financially, yeah. everything. You need to you need to prepare very well in order to achieve your aims and your objectives. In order to be successful, you need to prepare very well. So, I believe that um, we were close. We were close to to actually um, get there just that uh, we blew out mm. our chances. We had the opportunity on two occasions. Mm. Um, mm. Let, let's talk about your time in Scandinavia because I realized that you spent what, basically close to 10, 11 years in yeah. Sweden, played for Jagadens, Junkar, played for Gefli. Um, what was the special draw to Sweden? And um, through my digging, I also discovered that you actually started this, your current journey while you were still a player. 
Yeah. Yeah, I actually, after the World Cup 2006, I mean, after we were beaten by Brazil, yeah. um, John Pencil had an agent at that time called Jack Moya. Okay. He's, he's a French. Um, so he was actually with us in Germany. Okay. He, he, was, he was attending our training. Mm -hmm. And he actually followed us right from Scotland to London and then to, to Germany. So in Germany, when he realized that I wasn't part of the team, he, 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 he spoke to John and asked John that oh, he, he saw me in training in Scotland and yeah. in London and he feels that I'm a good player. But he, he realized that I've not been part, I've not been playing. So mm. John explained to me that no, I'm, I'm just a standby uh, member of the team. So he actually spoke to a club in, in France, Rennes, Olympic Rennes. Yeah. And they asked me to come over. So after our uh, exit from the World Cup, I, I didn't come back with the team to Ghana. Okay. Uh, so I traveled to France with him. I trained with Ren for three days, and then they showed interest. I was contracted to Kotoko at that time, so they had to negotiate with mm -hmm. management. I think the negotiations didn't go well. It was very. It was four days to to close the transfer window. So. Mm. On the last day, they couldn't make it, and I, I was actually I was very disappointed. Mm. I thought mm. I thought that uh, Kotoko should have uh, at least um, considered me, because I've already spent uh, three years, uh, three and a half years with, with them already. So they should have at least considered my career mm. um, instead of uh, the money that they think they deserve to be paid, which of course uh, it's, it's their right. But then. Um, it all went well. I, I came back, and that was the time I decided to to stop uh, playing football mm -hmm. in order to further my education because I had I'd already had a scholarship yeah. uh, to study in the U.S. at um, Cal Baptist University. Uh, the scholarship had been waiting for me all this while. I told the school that okay, they should let me go to the World Cup, and after the World Cup, I'll, I'll see if I, I can come. Mm. So when I came back from, from France, I actually decided that, OK, I mean, it's, I've had uh, three, three and a half years with Kotoko. Uh, it's, it's enough with it's football. Enough, yeah. So let me just go back to school and, and, and take it up from there. But um, the management members and the, some of the board members at that time uh, Mr. Kwabnakesi, mm -hmm. uh, the late PV Oben, yeah. and uh, Kwame Despite, they all spoke to me. So at that time, I, did, I didn't even know that there was another offer waiting on yeah. the table. That the offer has been there for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Because the money wasn't enough, they didn't want to take it. And that was the offer to Israel. I think the transfer fee was, it was a loan with an option. It was $50,000 mm -hmm. loan fee with an option to buy for, I think, hundred or 150000 so then they said, okay, um, there is an offer uh, to Israel. So yeah. if you want, we can, we can use that option. I said, okay, yeah, why not? So we, we went to Egypt in one of the um, Champions League games. Mm -hmm. And from there, I didn't come back. I continued to Israel. Hmm. Nice. Now, tell me about how you got into player agency, player representation. And I, I realized be, because a lot of your players at the time were playing in Sweden. In Sweden, yeah. Eduko, Fiyu, Waris, and Co. were all playing in that, in that sector. How, yeah. how did you get into it so far? And, and, and what has been the yeah. journey like? Yeah, so after, after my, my career in, in Israel, I spent a year in Israel. Okay. It was a one-year contract. So when I came back, uh, I came back to Kotoko, though I was a free player. Um, they were playing in the in the top four tournament, so I came to play a couple of games. Um, I think my first game again was against House of Work in Sunyani. Mm -hmm. uh, we beat them, and I was voted uh, man of the match. So we were supposed to travel to Germany on on a tour, training tour, okay. uh, and then uh, in between that, I had the offer to to go to Sweden. So I left. I actually didn't join the team to Germany. Uh, it was actually Kotoko who got me the visa mm. because we already had a visa to go to yeah. Germany. So it was that same visa that I, I, used, I traveled to go to. I went to Denmark first, uh, Randes from there, then I went to, I went to Sweden. So uh, my career started in Sweden in 2008 um, with Gefel IF. Yeah. I signed a, a two years contract. So after the two years contract, I, I extended it for two more years. Um, and then from there, Hugo Gordon bought me. I went to Hugo Gordon. So 
Once in, in, in Garfield, I, I introduced two Ghanaian players, Zakaria and Joachim Aduko. Okay. Yeah, so they came. So then um, I started interacting with the Ghanaian players over there. I formed a, a WhatsApp group where mm. we used to exchange. So more like because you were the one who was established there, you were looking out for their welfare. Exactly. So I established a WhatsApp group where we used to uh, share ideas and uh, share our problems. And, and, and because I, I, I was there for, for a couple of years, um, I knew the, a little bit of the regulations. And uh, I was the system and how it works. Exactly. I was helping a lot of the players in, in filing their taxes. And uh, whenever they want to invite any family member, the process to go through and, and all that. I, 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 was, I was doing that for them. So it was actually um, the same boys who I was mentoring. Mm -hmm. I, I was doing this for free. I was helping my younger brothers. I never had the intention of uh, uh, doing it as a profession or for mm. money. But it was actually Daniel Amate and Majid Waris. They said, hey, um, and um, Ruben Ayana. Yeah. They said, hey, uh, you're doing a good job for us, and we think you do good as an agent. Hmm. Because uh, some of them had agents already, yeah. and they were not getting those services that I was rendering to them. So they actually told me to, to give it a thought. Waris kept telling me to give it a thought, uh, to consider it as, as a job. So I said, OK, um, I'll see. But along the line, I got transferred uh, from Ugodin to, to Alanya Sport in Turkey. Yeah. I went to Turkey. Uh, within a short time, I got injured. Uh, it, it was a, it has, it was an injury that got to do with the nerves. Mm. Mm. So I was away for a year. I came back to Sweden to do rehabilitation. I was out for a year. So when I recovered, um, I signed for guys, played for guys for a year, and then went to Yonshile for a year. Mm. Yonshile actually, I signed, I signed a year, but they extended it for two more years. Mm -hmm. But then. Um, the boys kept giving me pressure. Uh, Amati, Waris, Ruben Ayana, yeah. Nasiru Mohammed. The pressure was mounting to the extent that I said, OK, um, guys, let's do this now. So I told my club at that time, I had two more years contract. I told them, I'm sorry, I would, I would like to quit. Um, it wasn't OK for them. They tried to, to convince me to stay, but I told them, I'm sorry, I just I just have to, mm. to quit and then concentrate on this new line of business that I've, I've got to do. So when I moved from, from playing active football, uh, these boys were already there for me to start, to start uh, managing. So mm. I went straight into, into the business, and here we are today. Club Consult Africa. Yeah. Looking good. Um, just, I want to ask a few things. Very little time on my hands, so I hope we can do this now. Tell me a little bit about Daniel Amati. What's his status now? What's going on with him? We care about him. He looks to have disappeared under that injury. Uh, yes. Um, Amati had had tough uh, periods, I think, for the past uh, two and two a half years. Yeah, two, two and a half years has been, has been very tough for him. Uh, yeah. He went to Leicester, started playing very well. Yeah. I mean, we all know the boy. It's, it's a huge, huge, mm. huge talent. Mm. Um, he was a prospect, and then unfortunately, um, he got injured. The first injury came. Uh, he spent a couple of months. He came back, started with the with the second team, yeah. and along the line with the second team, he got injured again. He, he went back uh, to do rehab, got back as soon as he started with the, with the first team, uh, got a couple of games, and then that, that injury happened again, uh, almost at the end of the game. Uh, I think it was against, um, I don't remember the, the opponents, but then uh, it, he got injured again, mm -hmm. and since then, it's been, it's been very tough. He, he's fit now in training, and we hope that Mm. I personally think it's time to leave to to leave Leicester or, or to find something else because um, uh, it's not been it's not been considered by mm. by the new gaffer and uh, it's time for him to 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 look elsewhere. But Amate is is a tough boy. Uh, he believes that uh, uh, he wants to fight for for a place if given the the opportunity. Mm. So it's two different scenarios. But let's see how how it goes for him. 
they say that these days you basically run a monopoly on the players in Ghana. Everybody is signed to Yusuf Chipsa one way or the other. Um, <laughs> don't run a smile on your face saying that no. you might not necessarily agree. Um, in terms of player pool, how many players do you have under your supervision? And I'm, I'm asking this in conjunction with also what happened with Kwame Bonsu, who's your player, and the Esperance controversy. How many players you have under your pool? And based on the, the messy situation that went on with that particular scenario, what would you do different as an agent if you had to deal with such a circumstance? Uh, well, offered, I think I have uh, over 35 players, wow. uh, yes, under my management. Um, uh, and the second question was... What would you do different, looking at that Kwame Bonsu situation and all the controversy brought, Calf Esperance, having to come and explain? What different approach would you take if you had to do that all over again? Well, I, I, I don't think I would, I would take any different approach because I, I never did anything wrong. Um, I don't think I, I did anything wrong, but then um, because there wasn't full disclosure mm. of information to me, yeah. I never knew Kotoko and Esperance had an issue uh, already uh, with an amount of $180,000 mm. involved. If I had known that, yeah. probably I wouldn't have signed an undertaking mm. or I would have rather chosen the wording of the undertaking very, very well because the undertaking assigned was I will be held responsible oh, if Esperance fails to pay the money. Mm. And I, I signed on that undertaking because I, I knew my job. Yeah. I knew the process to take Esperance through mm. if they fail to pay the money. Mm. Based on that, I was so confident of myself. And that is why, that was why I signed that undertaking. Mm. But if, if there was full disclosure of information to me that, hey, listen, we already have an issue with Esperance. Yeah. And there's an outstanding payment of yeah. 180,000. Yeah. I would have known how to go about the transaction yeah. better than what what actually happened. So on my part, I did nothing wrong, yeah. and uh, um, it was unfortunate that it, it ended that way. Now, I also know that you were interested in taking over Kim Faisal Football Club. I don't know what happened along the way, but that deal didn't materialize. Can you talk us through that a bit and how that came about and how eventually we are where we are now? Uh, yes, actually it wasn't me as a person because that would be a conflict of interest in the first place. But then yes, I was in, in a way involved because um, uh, Alaji, Alaji is my father. I mean, Alaji was the one who actually spotted me from coast football. It was actually my coast coach, uh, Malam, we call him. He mentioned me to Alaji Rose like that, hey, there is a boy who I think will do good uh, in the Premier League mm. club. So have a look at him. So Alaji, I went to Kim Faisal. Yeah. We trained for, for, for a while. They saw me, they liked me. But it was Alaji who who gave me the opportunity to actually feature in the Premier League club because when I was registered, um, first four games of the Premier League game uh, matches, I was never in camp. Mm. I wasn't even invited at all because the then coach saw me to be young, uh, a coach player mm. who has just uh, signed for a Premier League club. I need time, he said. I need time to actually uh, get into the system. Uh, so the fourth game was against RTU in Kumasi. They came there to beat us, 2-1 uh, or 2-0. And the next game, the fifth game, was against Kumasa Santi Kotoko. So Alaji was at the training grounds from Monday to Friday. He saw everything. And then at the end of the Friday um, training, a list of players uh, were mentioned to go to camp. And I was in part. Mm. So I was home on Saturday when Alaji drove to my house and said, uh, he wants me to join mm. the team in camp. I said, no, Alaji. Uh, I wasn't invited by the coach, so I'm not going. Uh, to cut things short, Alaji forced me to go to camp, and then um, the coach said, Alaji says you can play, so uh, just try your luck and let's yeah. see. And yeah. that is how everything yeah. started. Since but then, I never, I never um, went out of the team mm. for the whole three years that I spent with Kim Fraser. Just, just a quick uh, one. We are almost out of time. Now, like you are saying, you and your investors 
or partners yeah. try to take over the club. They are at the bottom of the league now, conceding goals in droves, relegation threatened. You think that they can survive under the current Grunsa leadership? Uh, it, it, it depends. Uh, we don't even know if the football is coming back soon. But then, if football should come back soon, it is going to be a very tough, a very tough one, uh, mm. considering their position on the league table. I mean, it's going to be uh, nothing is impossible. Yeah. I mean, uh, but it's really tough. It's going to be really tough for them to escape relegation. But uh, if you look at the team and if you look at their results, I think Kinfesel has been scoring almost every game. Yeah. So it has to do with their defense. So if they do proper um, recruitment for the second round, if football should come back, get uh, better defenders, I think they will be able to... Let's say football this. comes back. Is Kim Feza in the danger of be becoming extinct? Uh, if, if they are going to continue with the same crop of players, uh, yes. Hmm. We hear that you've, you've pursued some higher education. You have an MBA? I'm yet to graduate. You're yet to graduate. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. You see, I have so much on the so much left on the table that I want to dig into, but unfortunately we can't do all that because of time. But I'm, I'm just hoping that we can just find a way to drag you back into this studio again, just so we can enlighten uh, the viewers. But that's about it from us here today on the tracker. Um, keep watching City TV. We'll be back same time next week.